Babiš. text, a 
can be a space, uh, language, emphasize text, code, mouth, like you name it. Uh, the actual definition for just inlines is about double that, and there's also more definitions for blocks and, the, and metadata and everything, so um, there's a lot of it, but it really boils down to a very central definition. And I ask you to keep this in mind because this is going to be important in a couple of places. Um, and as you can see, this is obviously Haskell. If you have ever seen Haskell before, uh, it's a Haskell data structure. And you might be wondering, like, why was Pandoc written in Haskell? And the answer uh, is very similar if you ask a couple of people uh, who wrote successful Haskell programs. It's usually, well, I like that language. I really wanted to use it in some kind of way. And that's how it ended up being written in Haskell. And this, uh, in the case of John McFarlane, he wanted to use the Parsec library. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a coincidence. But how does this affect the program or the project as a whole? And for this, I really want to take a look at the contributions and how people contribute to the project. Because Haskell isn't known to be very accessible, and you can see this in quotes like these, which is an actual quote from our um, Pandoc discuss mailing list, um, where um, somebody said, well, I don't know enough Haskell to create a pull request. Like, they want to contribute, but Haskell is keeping them from doing that. Which is bad. We'd like everybody to contribute. And I wondered, like, how common is this? And uh, can we put some data on this? So I looked for similar projects, uh, which I could use to compare Pandoc with. And I ended up with these three projects in the end. Um, Sphinx is another document um, documentation system really it's all of these are incredibly good i really recommend any one of these um, one is written in python uh, ascii doc or ascii doctor um, nowadays it's written in ruby previous implementation was python they all have kind of a similar age and the lines of code are also in the same order of magnitude so i think those are good projects to compare. And I said, okay, if Haskell really puts people off, then we should be able to see that. And we should be able to, like, if we look at how many people contribute just a few commits, then this should be like a lot rarer um, with Haskell. Um, so I got that data, plotted it out. And as you can see, it's not really the case. Like, um, there are differences between the projects, but uh, Pandox actually like kind of in the middle between ASCII Doctor and Sphinx. So um, the number or the percentage of contributors who contributed uh, one commit actually kind of looks the same. And this gets even more obvious if you look at the cumulative distribution, um, where we just look at, okay, how many people contributed, say, nine commits or less. And as you can see, it all like goes up to around 90%. So consistently for all three projects, 90% of people contrib don't contribute more than a single single digit number of commits. Which I find interesting. Like, okay, there, apparently there isn't much of a difference here, which should be good news to everybody who's uh, using Haskell. But still, like, um, those are all relative numbers. Let's check the absolute numbers of contributors. And now we're talking, now we see, okay, there is like a serious difference. There's, 50% more contributors to the Sphinx Python project than there are to Pandoc. Like I only checked uh, the, the main repositories 
uh, for this, um, which has the unfortunate effect that ASCII doctor is actually underrepresented here because ASCII doctor is spread across many, many different repositories and I just I chose to just analyze the one central repository. So these uh, like this data is unfair for ASCII doc or ASCII doctor. But it's very representative I think for Sphinx and Panda and yeah it does have an effect. But if you look at this and then think about how many people actually know Haskell and how many know Python. And I plotted this here, this data is taken from Stack Overflow, um, a survey from 2017. And this shouldn't be surprising, there's a lot of people who know Python. There are quite a few people who know Ruby but only 1.8% of all like, participants in that survey said they know Haskell. So if you compare that to the previous slide, um, where we look at total contributors, you see, okay, this is actually pretty good. Like, people who know Haskell apparently like to contribute code and to write code, so this is already interesting. And like, we can dig even deeper and look how involved are people if they choose to contribute? And for this, we checked um, how many lines of code people add in total. Like, all three languages, Ruby, Python, and Haskell, are very expressive. I'd even argue Haskell is more exp expressive than the other ones. And as you can see, people who contribute to Pandoc contribute more. So everybody who's, maybe that's like hyperbole, but people who write Haskell seem to like writing code more. Uh, which I think should, like, employers, employers take note. If you want good guys, maybe write your, pro um, your projects using Haskell. And, okay, so I was um, talking about contributions a lot, and um, there isn't only code contributions, uh, there's also all the commu community handling and uh, documentation and everything, and I unfortunately don't have any data on this, also because it doesn't really matter in the um, context of Haskell. But I still want to mention it because this is often forgotten. Um, at least for Pandoc, we're incredibly lucky to have a huge and great community which is very helpful to newcomers and really yeah, makes the project better as a whole. So, um, I promised you to talk a bit about the, the actual effects on what we saw in, while programming uh, Haskell and the code drawbacks. And also, like, I'd like to talk how you can mitigate those draw drawbacks, because I think nobody would argue that there aren't any drawbacks to programming Haskell. Um, first of them is, as you saw before, like, people don't necessarily know Haskell or want to write Haskell, so a good way to still like include those people is to accommodate them and to say, fine, don't write Haskell, here's a different way of doing things. And John McFarlane had this incredibly good idea of using um, the, the central the AST document structure and to allow people to modify it. And there are multiple ways to do so. One of them on the left is to use uh, Lua, which is a small embeddable programming language, so um, you can use that to just write small scripts, uh, modify the document structure, and then output the result. Or you could do the same using um, basically any programming language, as long as it can pass JSON. So Pandoc has the ability to output uh, the AST as a JSON object, and in this case, like, when
that you see here is how just the string hello world would look um, in the JSON output. And this can be consumed in yeah, any library that supports it. There are libraries for Python, for PHP, for JavaScript, you name it. So this made it possible to include people even though they do not know Haskell. Another drawback are libraries. Um, at least back in 2006, when the program started, uh, there were a lot of libraries missing. And what happened was that John McCauley had to write a lot of the libraries himself. Uh, for example, uh, many document formats are actually kinds of zip containers, and so he had to write a library which takes zip archives and can decompress those. This didn't exist. That's still like sometimes the case that you'll have to write your own libraries if you're using Haskell. I think it's gotten much better, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, also, the the whole tool chain of Haskell is kind of non-standard. If you um, if you go and tell somebody, well, just install that Python package, uh, it will probably easy, be easy for most people. Uh, they'll just pick install or whatever, and they know exactly what to do. If you tell them, well, install that Haskell program, not many people will know what to do. So um, to accommodate people there uh, is more difficult. One way is to just say, hey, install GHD, you'll be fine. Uh, John, John McCollin actually said like, okay, maybe Pandoc is this virus which spreads the GHC, GHC compiler, like the Haskell compiler into um, people's uh, computers. And I think he's quite right with that. But that alone can't be the solution. So there are other things like pack it up nicely, make it easy for people to use it, uh, like uh, provide Linux um, binaries and Windows binaries, and we also have Docker builds, obviously. All that stuff to make it just really easy and to make people forget this is actually written in Haskell. And it works quite well because people are often surprised that Pandora is written in Haskell. So I think, um, yeah, the, it's a job good done, well done. So, with all those drawbacks, and you have to work around that. Like, why, again, like, why would you be using Haskell? And my first answer to that is surprisingly libraries. Like, you'll probably say, hey, I saw that slide before, and said something completely different. <coughs> well, sure, but I think the situation has improved a lot, and also the libraries that do exist are very amazing and high quality. So, prime example, Parsec, the parser library, is an amazing piece of work. But um, there are also, like for the web, Haskell is, is great. Uh, one of the highest star, star projects on GitHub is Postgres. Uh, which is um, an interface, like a REST interface to a PostgreSQL database. And uh, that has little to do with parsing, but a lot to do with databases and JSON and whatsoever. And it works great, it's really popular. And um, I talked to Joe Nelson um, about it and she said, yeah, well, it's, it's amazing what we did and with like, the few lines of code that we actually had to write. It's more than a few lines, but it's, um, I think you get the point. It's, a, it's quite amazing what you can do with the libraries that do exist. And yeah, that is a prime, like, common claim about functional programming, that purity helps in some kind of way. And again, I'm quoting uh, John McCauley in here. Uh, he said that purity helps to preserve sanity. And I, I think he's right with that. Um, what happens is, if you, if you have little time and have to maintain 
a popular open source project, you can't always dive deep, deep into the code and check every single line of code that you, the same way you would in a commercial setting. But uh, sometimes you just have to, okay, it looks fine, and with half, like good typing, this is very easy, because you look at the types, you see, okay, this is what it's gonna do, it won't do any like I.O., it won't access the database, won't modify the global state, and you'll be sure, I don't have to understand it in detail, looks about right, result looks good, fine. Nothing will break on the other side of your application. That's why I think it really preserves sanity. But quite relatedly, um, Haskell is also really nice if you look at testing. Uh, writing unit tests is a lot simpler if you have pure functions. Uh, but it's also really well known for uh, having property checks like quick check the library and lean check and all those different um, property checking libraries. They make the whole experience a lot nicer and um, like the, the author of Shell Check, Vaida uh, Hulun, uh, basically said, yeah, it's so nice that you really want to write tests and uh, he's not like a testing enthusiast, but still his code base is very well tested simply because it's so easy. And also mocking is surprisingly easy. Um, there are different ways of doing it and there's a lot of discussion in the Haskell community, what's the right way to handle side effects, um, but all of them make it rather easy to just write a pure implementation of whatever you want to do and to mock your effects out and to use that to test your effectful code. Fanduck does the same. Uh, I'm using that as an example. There's a central Pandoc monad which contains, uh, which is a type class, contains all the, the effects that um, Pandoc has to, to handle and this type class can be implemented in I.O. or with the help of I.O. or just with pure functions and you can use the pure stuff to test it quite, uh, quite nicely. But um, I think what makes, what's really great about Haskell and what totally takes the cake is refactoring. Because the typing and, and the type system helps a lot with uh, finding what you need to change and the compiler will tell you exactly, oh you forgot to change that. And so you don't have to rely only on tests, even though tests are still a very good idea, but the compiler will really, really help you. And, um, I want to nail that point down by looking at an example, again, taking from Pandoc, obviously, um, which has to do with the central data structure. And in 2006, when Pandoc was created, there was only a single string type in Haskell, which is called string. And People who program in Haskell will know this string type is very like um, memory hungry because it's just a linked list of characters and in a normal program you'd use text, like a different string type or text. Because the, the central structure is so very central, this affects a lot of the program. Basically the whole program has to be changed if you change something in that structure. And it's very tedious and nobody wanted to do it for a really long time until, like, like at the end of last year, a guy not called Christian Despreeze came in and just did it. And he hadn't contributed to any open source Haskell project before, not to Panda. Like, he didn't really know the code base. He just said, okay, I'm gonna do it. And he dived in and did it. And that, I find that mind blowing, that somebody is able to, without knowing the code base in a very like, precise way, what's happening there, there, to just dive in and 
whip out one thing, put in another, fix all the stuff that comes up, and be done with it. And I think this should show you and convince you that um, refactoring using Haskell is incredibly pleasant. Um, I thought about doing a live demo. I'm going to put that in, at the end. And instead, I um, want to wrap up and um, first of all, put out a lot of thank yous for people who helped me with the talk. Um, obviously, um, the uh, Dwight Holland, who wrote Shellcheck, uh, the currently most start project on GitHub, um, offered a lot of insights into what he thinks uh, Haskell did to both this project as um, the same uh, did uh, like Joey Nelson. Uh, he's the author of uh, Postgres. Uh, he also gave a lot of insights, and I'm, unfortunately, I can't put everything I learned from them into the talk. I hope to put it out there someday, but it's really good advice. Um, also, many thanks to Christian Despries, not only because he did this amazing refactoring, but also because he allowed me to use that example in the talk. And uh, many thanks to my colleague, Elizabeth Kant, who helped me with the data analysis. She's a data scientist, so that probably was a piece of cake for her. Uh, and of course, last but not least, a lot of thanks to John McFarlane, who wrote Pandoc, and to everybody involved with, um, with Pandoc and the whole community working with it. It's uh, a great pleasure, simply because they are all there. If you like to support Pandoc, there's the easy way of just taking out your credit card and sponsor. There's the much more easy way of using GitHub and to write some code and to fix some bugs. Uh, that's always a really, really helpful thing. Um, nobody is actually getting paid for, um, for developing Pandoc, so any contribution is most welcome. Where does the sponsoring money go? <laughs> um, well, people... Sorry. <laughs> I can, I can I'll, yeah, answer that later. Um, so, yes, as a summary, uh, if you think about using Haskell, by all means, please do. It's, it's a great language and you should really leverage it for what it offers. And even though it does have its weaknesses and side effects, which you'd not like, it's still possible to mitigate those. And if you're worried about not finding people, I hope I was able to convince you this is not the case, because people really, really like to program in Haskell. And, of course, for all your programming needs, please do Pandoc. Do use Pandoc. So, yeah, that's it with the talk and I'll, I think I'll take some questions if that's okay and then dive into the presentation, uh, like live demo of Pandoc. System, but um, if we encode everything into the type, the type would be very complex. So um, a lot of elements, for example, allow to have arbitrary attributes. So we use those to encode a lot of information. And yeah, that's um, a 
and some, as I said, is, is lost because uh, we mostly care about the structure of documents and uh, the structure is very well represented using uh, the existing code base. But a um, lot of rendering details is just too much to handle, so that's discarded. Say we should leverage Haskell for its strengths, and one feature that makes Haskell unique, even amongst the functional, statically typed programming languages, is laziness. Yes. Do you have anything, like any opinions on that? Um, yeah, I have many opinions on that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I love and hate laziness. Um, it's, uh, it came up in conversation with uh, the Containers of pop this uh, Haskell projects that I mentioned, um, and pretty much everybody mentioned that at least at some point laziness kind of got in the way because there were memory leaks, um, which is really ugly. Uh, I don't think there's any language which reliably performs well, so I don't see that as really the bad thing. Um, at least not with the expressiveness that, that Haskell has. Uh, but uh, for the good stuff, I very much like laziness uh, for just freeing me of having to think about certain details. It's dangerous because at some point you have to think about it if performance is degrading. But most of the time you can just go, um, well, sure, I don't mind if this is calculated now or later or never, I'm just going to use that value and see what happens. And usually it produces a very good and fast program. So yeah, that's, that's my opinion on laziness. OK, then um, if you have more questions later, I'll consider that. I Um, Hamlet is a command line program, so I'm going to use the command line. Is that big enough, or should I make it bigger? Okay, that's that's better. Cool. Um, first thing I'd like to show you is uh, the talk, which is of course written using Hamlet, and. It's written in Markdown in this case, and it's just a Markdown file. Uh, let me make that a bit smaller again. I'm sorry. <coughs> eh, still a bit. And all all the slides are just plain Markdown. So uh, I have my speaker notes in there in special containers, and. Uh, yeah, the, the rest is just plain normal markdown as you'd expect. And the way I'm using this is I uh, have a, a make file, which often is a really good idea to use some kind of make file because it makes your life a lot simpler. Pandoc is quite powerful, it ta takes a lot of options. You don't want to have to remember all the options all the time you call it. So if you can combine them somewhere, either in a script or, in this case, in a, in a make file, it will make your life a lot easier. And um, there, as you can see, there's stuff like uh, the, I was hoping for my mouse to appear on there, but it doesn't. Um, there's something with the uh, filters, so I'm actually <coughs> using a small Lua filter to modify my, um, my slides. And uh, other than that, it's pretty straightforward. It's just, it calls Pandoc with a lot of options. Uh, it tells it to use Reveal.js as its output format. So um, the talk was the real Reveal.js slides. Uh, I'm using a custom template. Uh, I'm using a special theme, I've added some, some custom 
CSS files, and in the end, what comes out is the talk you just saw. Um, this, of course, um, I mean, that might be interesting, but even more interesting is that you can uh, do different formats. So, if we want to make the talk uh, as a PDF document, we can do so. We can create uh, um, a Beamer slide, slideshow, and let me show you, or not, this is surprising, what happens? Oh, yeah, if I add the file name, which probably <laughs> works better. Uh, okay, and yeah, here's the slideshow. Same, same source, still quite an acceptable slideshow. Um, you can, it's less styled obviously because I didn't put any effort in <coughs> styling it, but uh, it still works. So this is cool. But how about um, other documents? And uh, one of the primary like, use cases of Pandoc is that it's being used in academia where people write uh, articles with it. Like, for example, um, our markdown, like our studio uh, uses Pandoc to convert from the R markdown format into whatever format you need. And uh, for that, to help with that, we have a project called Pandoc Scholar, uh, I've written with uh, Robert Winkler. <coughs> And uh, what it does, it, it takes uh, um, in, like Markdown, an article. Uh, you can specify all your metadata, which is very important with academic articles. Uh, you can do so using just JAML, put that in there. Uh, write, write your article. Um, this down here is uh, a reference to, uh, in your to your bibliography, which is also really important for academic writing. So it's all in here, and then you can run that. I always wrote, like, have a make file for that. And it produces a couple of output formats here, and one of them is uh, HTML. So look at the article uh, in HTML. Friend is okay. You can style it as you want. Uh, the, uh, something very interesting for people using it in, in academia is to be able to specify the affiliations and all that. Um, we wrote a special Lua filter to make it easier to handle. And you can use something different, you could say, show me, um, show me a docx, like a word file, okay, that's taking a while, there it is, same source, if you have to, if there's a journal which asks you, please give us the document in a, in a word format, Pandoc has, has got you covered, so that's nice, and, um, yeah, how about, say, a PDF again? There we go. A nicely set LaTeX, uh, like typeset using LaTeX PDF, just from the markdown source. So, and um, basically it goes on and on. You can, uh, you can list the the input and output formats uh, using the command line. And yeah, it doesn't fit on the screen. Uh, there are many, many input formats. Let's see how many there are. 34 input formats. And 57 output formats. There's a lot you can do. Yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks.